So welcome everybody to the second workshop of the Hasanda consultation series. Today we're going to be discussing what data content conventions and standards we require in the data asset. To begin, I acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. Today's workshop is going to run for 90 minutes. We'll start with three short presentations. We'll hear uh, back from Adrian, who will summarize some of our outcomes from the last workshop. I'll then explain how we build the foundations required of a data sharing platform in order uh, to find the data that we need in the format that we need it. And Dr. Melina Wilson uh, will give us some insights into the issues she faces in locating and making use of the data she needs when reviewing clinical trials. We'll then break out into groups for around an hour to get your feedback on the topics raised. A quick reminder that your mics will be muted during the presentations. Uh, and it might be handy to turn off your cameras. Today's program won't feature a Q&A session. However, you'll have plenty of time for discussion during the breakout groups. And depending on how the workshop plays out, we may do a brief wrap up on the issues raised at the very end. So on screen now, the two focus questions we'll be asking your feedback on during the breakout groups. In addition to the reference document for today's workshop, you should have also received a worksheet to use during the breakout groups. It was attached to either an email or a calendar invite you would have received. Uh, so please make sure you have that ready to go. Uh, this time around, we won't be sending out a post-workshop survey. Instead, we're dedicating the majority of the workshop to the breakout sessions uh, and completing the workshop will form part of that session. But if you choose, you'll have seven days to provide your own written submission via our feedback site. So now having gone through the housekeeping, I'll hand over to Adrian, who'll provide an overview of what came out of our first workshop. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Adrian, Adrian Burton. I work at the ARDC. Just as a reminder, the ARDC is kind of a, uh, the collaborating glue here that's bringing together the uh, Hassanda Initiative. Um, the Australian Research Data Commons is uh, guided by a, uh, an advisory committee for this Hassanda Initiative that includes representatives from uh, ACTA, uh, ARA, NHMRC, the ANZ, CTR, Research Australia and Cochrane Australia. And uh, we are uh, in the middle of the first phase of this Hassanda um, Initiative. The first phase is uh, dubbed data development because we are before we build any infrastructure or make any new policies or whatever uh, we're just getting an idea of what is the data that we're talking about in this new national data asset for uh, health studies and um, so we're really scoping in on some of the there's a process of four workshops that you can see on the screen now that are looking at different aspects of the data asset itself. Last workshop, we um, were focusing in on what was the purpose, you know, what research would you be able to do with this data asset? And, you know, what, what on earth we were trying to achieve here? So what kind of data would you need for those purposes is the following questions. So theme A was uh, our last workshop. Theme B is highlighted here in orange. We're now saying, okay, given those purposes, what content and what kind of quality would there would that data um, have to be to support those that those research purposes? We'll have a further workshop on looking at some existing data and practice uh, data standards and practices, and uh, a fourth workshop on the um, systems and the barriers and enablers, enablers to such an initiative. What we hope to get out of the, this whole, cons this first consultation process is what we might loosely call a, a set of business requirements for an infrastructure. What, what kind of infrastructure should it be? What kind of scope should it have? What kind of content should it uh, hold? 
Um, so that's what will be the output of this uh, set of consultations, the data development phase of cons consultations. Um, and then the, that sketch of the Hassander business requirements will go off in two directions. One will be uh, for an infrastructure arm, what kind of infrastructure could we build that would um, actually address those business requirements. And then we will also take that kind of uh, sketch of Hassanda off for much wider stakeholder engagement, um, saying, okay, if we bring together this kind of a national data asset for these kind of research purposes, um, what do the, the patient groups think about that? What do the trialists think about that? What do the, the institutions, etc.? So that's a much more a broader, um, I suppose it's a more of the, the culture and the uh, framing of, of such an initiative with these key stakeholder groups. So that's where we are in the process. We've done theme A, you are now in theme B. So if you've joined the wrong Zoom, now's the time to leave. To leave. So uh, we are now in the second stage of this data development um, process. Um, what did we learn from the theme A? Uh, some of the we've got a, a group of uh, an editorial board who's working in the background here i won't mention their names but we will thank them for their contributions um, they have been capturing some of the uh, discussions from the th theme a the first thing that you know to report is that these um, research purposes uh, that were proposed um, you know, have been identified and confirmed and, if you like, endorsed by this uh, consultation process that um, building a national data asset from the outputs of clinical trials and other health studies uh, would allow you to um, you know, perform meta-analysis, clinical guideline development, new study design. Um, this comes from, just to remind you, uh, at that previous workshop there were 41 respondents and we re received an, an extra set of structured respondents uh, through the survey and uh, other just sort of general uh, feedback. So uh, this is quite important in that uh, for all the decisions we make into the future um, we will come back to this to say well if, you know, what kind of data is needed? Well, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to quality or, or conventions or um, the information systems in general. You always have to come back to say, well, what do you want it to do? And so this is what we want our national data asset to do. We want it to support these kind of research purposes. So we will keep referring back to these as our, our guidance um, when we have to make calls about the scope of the initiative. Um, Tiffany and a few of the others in the editorial group did some really nice work just looking through those. These use cases were, if you take the 48% researcher and the 15% trialist, 4% systematic reviewer here, a good chunk of the use cases that came from those research purposes were really aligning with um, what the researchers, health studies researchers, uh, need and want to do in this area, as well as having a healthy, you know, another sort of 25% of other applications um, to do with um, your know, broader impact and uh, providing uh, value to the uh, health consumers and, you know, a number of other stakeholders. But kind of shows is that there's a strong research, this is a research infrastructure initiative, and that it has application elsewhere. The kind of data, so for those purposes that we've identified there, the kind of data that, that people uh, said would be required in order to do that kind of research. Um, you can see here at the bottom, uh, individual patient data is strongly um, comes out as a, as a requirement for the Hassander initiative to, to focus on if, if we want to support those kind of research. It's uh, the IPD which is going to enable that as well as a second category, which is to do with having the details around the protocols and the methods, the methodologies and the, the details around the data, like the data dictionaries. Those two things clearly come out as the key sort of 
um, priority areas, um, as well as a little um, sort of hump around standards, which we'll get back to as well. When we just take the, the, the researchers and the research requirements, uh, those um, themes that we saw in a previous slide are actually just uh, magnified even more that researchers there were well over 75% saying that the IPD was the key uh, data sets that they were looking for, data components. Um, and here, look, there's a number of uh, we asked, you know, well, what would be the value if we if we did build up this national data asset for, from uh, health studies data? What would be the kind of value that that you would be able to see out of this? Um, you've got about a quarter of them, a quarter of the responses highlighting uh, the efficiencies and cost savings and research productivity. That's probably also related to the other two big categories that you know a standardized platform uh, and standardized ethics and consent uh, that standardization you know comes through as one of the key uh, efficiencies that can be um, captured out of such an initiative i'll just skim over here look the, the initiative the, the initial observations from the theme a is that the uh, there are a number of very important research uses that have been confirmed those use cases line up with uh, very strongly with researcher needs. Uh, the Hassandi initiative should look at promoting data standards um, and trying to embed those inefficient research practices. Um, but with having a, a good consideration of not increasing the administrative burden and that the, those standards actually should be uh, really um, catalyzing uh, secondary use of data into the future. Um, and then to sort of sum up there that for the purposes that, that, that were identified, that there is a strong need for individual patient data and methods, protocols, and data dictionaries to support that. So that's just a quick um, overview of where we uh, got to from the outputs of our previous workshop. And I'll hand over to Kristen to cover uh, where we're going to in this particular workshop. Great, thank you, Adrian. Uh, so today I'm going to be discussing the foundations for building a data sharing platform uh, now that we have some idea of the research purpose and use. So designing any kind of platform starts with identifying the purpose, as I said, and that's what we did in the first workshop. Once we know this, we can pin down what kind of information it needs to provide to the users and what traits, qualities, or conventions need to be present in the information for it to be findable and usable. In the context of the data development process, this is what we refer to as the data content and the data quality of the asset. Uh, and in this context, I should point out the term quality uh, should not be confused with the statistical or scientific concepts of reliability or validity of the data. That's definitely not something that we decide. Uh, what we mean by quality are the characteristics and conventions used in the data. So that may be sounding a bit abstract for some of you. So let's discuss this in terms of some existing data sharing platforms and what they do. When using a data sharing platform, the first thing most users interact with is the search or browse functions. On the Vivly platform, apart from searching via keywords, we see a number of search filters that allow users to search for trials using fields like study design, trial phase, and sample size. On Yoda and clinicalstudydatarequest.com, we see search fields for medicine or treatment type and medical condition. The categories used in these fields influence the findability of data as they determine the search results we receive back from the platform. Here on Vivly, when we uh, view our search results, we see that there are additional categories or fields that are applied to each trial. Again, we see information about the medical condition uh, and treatment studied in the trial. If we click on one of those search results and look further into the information available in that trial's record, we see not only additional fields for categorizing the trial, but also an indication of what categories of data and documents are available from that trial. 
on Yoda, we see something similar, albeit with a different layer. And it's worth noting the predefined categories at the top, so those green buttons on screen, uh, which indicate whether things like the study summary document is available or if the data specification or data dictionary is available. If we now look at an example from a platform used by dementia cohort studies, so not clinical trials, we see that they list the specific kinds of patient data available. For example, the kind of variables relating to physical health information, cognitive testing, and so on. On the previous screens, on those other platforms, that information wasn't available, and you would need to read through the study summary document from a trial to find out what kinds of data they have collected. But on the other hand, when we look at how the dementia platform lists study documentation, we see that there are no predefined categories for things like study protocol or data dictionary, case reports, or so on. In the example on screen, we see that this particular researcher has chosen to upload their data dictionary, but it's not a predefined category of what the platform requires. Uh, this dementia platform has a different research purpose to Vivli and Yoda. It has a narrower focus on providing participant data from cohort studies that can be pulled together for data harmonization and mega analysis. And so for these guys, information types like adverse event reports are not important for their aims. The point that I'm trying to draw out here is that having clarity on the categories of information we need about a trial impacts both the findability of the data and its usability relative to our nominated research purposes. But if we go back to the search results and click on the study report link uh, for a trial, oh, I might have skipped. Uh, if we go back to our clinical trials platform and take a look at one of the study reports it holds, we see our next layer down of finer grain detail about one of the trials. Uh, this is a screenshot of just the first page of this particular report, but we see that the document includes information like the trial's objectives, and on later pages, which I won't display, it goes on to summarise the protocol and outcomes and so on. Uh, go back to the search results again and click on the study report uh, for another trial. We see a similar looking document that provides similar information but it uses different conventions for reporting that information. So on this particular platform, a clinical study report is a standard category uh, of output or information from a trial, but the information contained within those reports is not standardized. Similarly, if we look at an example of one of the data specification documents or data dictionaries, uh, we see a PDF uh, and lists particular sets of traits for all variables present in their patient data, so variable name, variable type, and so on. But if we open up the data dictionary from another trial listed on that site, we see an entirely different layout, this time a spreadsheet, and it contains similar information, but it's not identical information. In addition to variable name and type, they also report the number of observations or sample size for each variable. Uh, we also see that they report variable type using a numeric code. So again, the thing that I'm highlighting is that on this platform, they have developed their preferred approach for categorizing the research output of trials, uh, and they use this as a standard for reporting of trials. But as you get more granular, there is less standardization on how the information is reported within each category. That inevitably will be the case with patient data itself, as here we move on to the finest levels of granularity and the greatest variety of information types. So most of us would know that there are many different ways just to code something as basic as age and education. And this kind of variety in standards is present in most patient data types, so whether it be blood tests, clinical assessments, or what have you. There may be some methodologies and data types for which there is a widely recommended best practice or standard, uh, and it will be important to get your feedback on this. But our goal isn't to list out the possible standards for every kind of data and information we might possibly encounter. Thank goodness for that. Instead, it is to decide what categories and standards we require or prefer, or at least find acceptable when finding and reusing data. 
and what the minimum amount of information we require to meet our nominated research purposes of systematic reviews, secondary analysis, and so on. Defining these things is how we will build the foundations of Fasanda. They are the things that will dictate how we design our repositories and catalogues so that they are the most effective for researchers. And the quality of these foundations is what determines the kind of tools we can then build on top of them in the future, whether that be search engines, data request application forms, or potentially down the track even more advanced technology like secure virtual analytical workspaces. So in our first workshop, we started to discuss data types, <clears throat> but in our breakout sessions today and in the feedback uh, we're looking from you, we really need to get to the specifics of what conventions we should use. So what are the best ways to categorize trials so that we can find the projects and data we're interested in? What are the minimum amounts of information those trials need to provide to meet our needs for secondary use of their data? And are there standards that are required or at least recommended for recording or reporting of that data? However, because we need to approach this practically, we need to prioritize these and decide which information and standards are essential to our purpose uh, and which of those are desirable and we could consider working towards perhaps in the future as the sand grows. Okay, so that's my overview of data content and data quality or uh, qualities in data sharing platforms. And I'd now like to hand over to Melina, who's going to give us some examples of the issues she faces uh, when working with shared data. Thanks, Kristen, and hello, everyone. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So um, today I'll briefly share some of the data challenges and needs from the perspective of conducting a Cochrane systematic review. And as many of you know, Cochrane has a very long list of mandatory requirements when developing and reporting the findings of a systematic review. And these requirements exist so that our judgments and decisions um, made about the trial data and our confidence in the overall evidence um, are transparent to the reader. So um, today I'll just uh, highlight two key challenges uh, that we, we come across and that's you know whether we have found all the, all the evidence on the systematic review topic and whether we can use the data for the systematic review. So this presentation will focus on systematic reviews and meta-analysis of aggregate data instead of individual participant data or IPD. Um, this is because in reality, most of us work with uh, aggregate data. Um, it, uh, it's, uh, this is because essentially we're usually working with limited resources and we need to complete the task within a specified time frame, which is usually shorter than might be required if you were doing an IPD review. So some translations before I begin. From my perspective, uh, when, when I think about data, I'm translating this into, that means a trial protocol, a clinical trial registry record, a conference abstract or a journal publication. Um, and when I hear standards required of the data, I'm translating that into reporting standards or guidelines. Um, so for, exa for example, there's the spirit recommendations and this is what um, a protocol, um, this is what needs to be addressed in a clinical trial protocol, for example. So to find the existing um, clinical trials on a systematic review topic, it can be quite a lengthy process and the process begins by searching a wide range of databases, as you can see here and also some, also some regional databases such as LILACs and subject-specific databases. Um, before you go about uh, searching these databases, one thinks about uh, what type of approach you're going to take um, and also the different types of syntax you might end up using. 
And I've highlighted here some clinical trial registries or, or platforms such as clinicaltrials.gov and the WHO's International Clinical Trials Registry platform because um, they all play a role within a systematic review. They capture information about completed trials, ongoing trials and trials that have um, stopped prematurely. So for example, if a trial has stopped prematurely, then we will still include the trial and uh, report data if available in a Cochrane review. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the forefront for us the, the value of preprint servers such as Med Archive, where findings are available online and have not been through the peer review process. So in addition to this, when we're looking for clinical trial data, we also contact experts in the field. Uh, we end up screening the uh, citations within existing systematic reviews and then the systematic reviews buried within the clinical practice guidelines. We also look for unpublished documents and that can, can be through various means, including you know, finding them through Google Scholar. So overall, um, what I'm trying to say is that it's quite a fragmented process. And as far as I'm aware, there's no one-stop shop that would allow one to search um, for, clinic, for, for studies um, uh, and in such a way that would also meet um, the, the requirements for Cochrane. Um, so whatever databases do exist around the world, as a systematic reviewer, the preferred scenarios would be that I could search those um, repositories in an intuitive fashion, and that could be through uh, using some controlled vocabulary, for example. So um, one intermediate step that is often left undescribed in, is the actual manual process that a systematic reviewer undertakes that actually involves stitching together all the uh, data for the one trial. So we do this so that we have the most um, complete view of the clinical, of the trial data under investigation and we can make assessment of the, the trial's quality. So this is what it typically looks like in a Cochrane review. Here we have a trial on the right hand side, it's called the ABCTCG trial. And we have all the different um, outputs from that trial. Um, we have the clinical trial registry record. We have a conference abstract, for example, that reports an important outcome uh, that mightn't be reported in the, an important outcome that from the systematic reviewer's perspective that might not be reported in the trial publication um, and then the trial publication. Um, and the challenge is that these links between the, the registered uh, clinical trial and the trial publication might be so, uh, it's sort of uncommon. There's still this high degree of manual linking. So a preferred scenario would that be uh, that there are these automatic links between the registered clinical trial record and the data outputs from the clinical trials. The other common challenge uh, that we face when working, uh, or actually I probably should say common observation that uh, we find when we're working with trial data from, um, is that we'll often start with a large number of included studies in the systematic review. For example, in this case, we ended up with 15 studies with over 11,000 uh, women included in, in, the, in the review. Um, but then by the time we drill down to the data in the trial publications, the number of studies and the number of people contributing uh, information for an outcome may be a lot lower, lower than expected. So for example, for a, quite a, a very, uh, for an important outcome, um, we end up with six, six studies with just over, with over 5,000 women. Um, this is a, a pretty good example, actually. So um, some things that play out and why we might see this is um, there are, you know, there are unclear methods in the trial publication or through the information that we can find. Um, the outcome data may not be reported in a useful format. So there's no numerical um, information, but a single summary sentence. And also the summary statistics are not reported and um, as is the case for some oncology trials. So the strategy, strategies that we end up using uh, to overcome these is that we contact trialists with specific uh, data requests and you know, ask them to reply within certain timeframes. 
where possible, we transform the data that has been reported in the trial publication into other into a useful format for meta-analysis. And uh, more recently, there are new methods uh, called synthesis without meta-analysis. So we can, you know, try to use at least some of the information from the trial publication. So the best practice scenario would be that clinical trials data are reported in line with internationally recognised reporting standards. Um, and I'm referring here to um, the, the many uh, standards, reporting standards that exist um, and they have been around, some of these have been around for quite a, a number of years. The fidelity to these standards can be uh, variable. So I've already mentioned the SPIRIT um, recommendations. We also have CONSORT, which I'm sure everyone knows about on this call. They've been around since 1996. That's for RCTs. Uh, there's also um, the CONSORT extension statements that cover cluster randomised control trials, for example, crossover trials, the list goes on. There's the template for intervention description and replication, the tidier checklist. So. Um, uh, reporting uh, about the intervention in sufficient detail so that someone, if needed, could replicate it, and then standards for diagnostic accuracy studies. So um, just a final po point um, around the role of clinical trial registries and the usefulness of these registries when conducting a systematic review. The WHO um, requires that trials registered on the clinical trial re registry complies with these um, minimum data set that you can see here. Um, and just as you can see there, the number 23 has this, says that a minimum requirement is the, the summary results reporting. Um, and here you can see the view of the US-based clinical trial registry. Um, and uh, you, down the bottom there, there is the study results tab. And when you click on that, um, what we find is we have the outcome uh, data being reported with number of participants and those who have had the event. And uh, we also have um, the summary statistics and uh, statistic and the um, and the statistical analysis performed. So um, yes, this is this is uh, perfect, so to speak. Um, so in terms of the preferred scenario, uh, it would be great if, and I think there's there's work in this area going on that the clinical trial registries also um, put together some guidelines of the essential criteria criteria for report results reporting. So in terms of a wish list, in some it would be um, a better linkage of the data outputs from a clinical trial, um, improved uh, implementation or compliance of those existing standards that I mentioned, um, and also if there, there could be some guidance uh, developed on the essential criteria for results reporting on clinical trial registries. So that's it from me, Kristen. Thank you. Great, thank you, Melina. And I might now hand over to Roxanne Foster from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. I think you're muted, Roxanne. Yeah, I think I think that's sorted now. Sorry, having some technical difficulties unmuting there. Can everyone see and hear me? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Um, let's just check that the screen is right. And um, so we've got data content and quality requirements up. So thanks, um, thanks, Kristen, for um, handing over to me, and and thanks to Melina for for your insights on data sharing from a clinical trials perspective. I'm Dr. Roxanne Foster from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the Metadata and Meteor Unit. We're providing expertise in data development principles and process to inform the Hacenda consultation phase. So before moving into the breakout rooms, I'll um, briefly just reiterate what we hope to achieve with today's workshop. So today's breakout sessions are an opportunity for open-ended discussion and further exploration of use cases that came out of the first workshop. We've considered feedback and extended sessions to about 50 minutes, providing more time for meaningful discussion. 
The aim is to gather feedback on these three topics. Uh, has Sanders data and metadata scope, minimum information requirements to facilitate data reuse for your research needs, and existing standards that can be leveraged or required standards that need to be developed. So standards in this context refers to common or routine reporting practices and data definitions. So this includes um, stock taking, what information and data standards are already out there, how comparable they are across institutions, and understanding how information capture might be aligned and standardized across the diverse systems from which data are drawn. Discussion will be guided by two key questions. Uh, question one, um, we'll be considering existing data sharing solutions that you've come across and assess their pros and cons. So what works well, what doesn't work um, when you try to share or use data or trial information. So this exercise will identify and confirm the common issues confronting researchers in data sharing and inform a list of requirements for the Hassander solution. Question two will capture the range of data content required using a shared works worksheet and expand on the specific requirements considering the issues that were raised in, in question one. So the aim is to document and prioritize the requirements to overcome data sharing issues and inform Hassander development. And part of this involves canvassing existing conventions or standards that work well for you, which Hassander could leverage. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'd like to ask you all now to move into your assigned breakout rooms um, and please let us know if you have any technical difficulties. Thank you.